saw Tom getting up the same time I was. I was going to let him preach, but he, he went the other direction. It's good to see each one of y'all. This is a, a kind of a hard time of the year, isn't it? There's so much sickness going on right now, and I don't think you can uh, hardly avoid it, it seems like. And uh, on top of that, uh, we, we uh, y'all, I say we, had a, a snowstorm. I know to you it wasn't. It was a skiff of snow. But let me tell you, coming up Monument Pass and going down Monument Pass, it was a snowstorm. It was a blizzard is what it was. I think they probably had at least half an inch up there. And it was just, it was, I'm so unused to driving in snow in, uh, for when we're, when Texas, when it snows, we just don't go anywhere. And here you, you can't, when I lived in Wyoming for 20 years, I would have just laughed at anybody that thought this was a snowstorm today, but we were coming up Monument Pass and Carolyn was asking me uh, if we were nearly to the top and I didn't even know we were on it because it had been snowing so hard and my windshield wipers weren't keeping up with it. And so I was surprised to even find that we were already to the top nearly. So I was glad we got to the top and to the bottom and I'm glad we got to town. Um, and it's good to see y'all out. I, I know these types of uh, evenings are hard. <laughs> And it would be, you probably had a hard work week and it probably would have been nice to have stayed home. And for you young people, after going to school all week, it would have been really, really nice to have stayed home. Uh, and, and yet you're here. And so hopefully uh, there'll be something within this lesson for young and old and everybody in between uh, that will maybe help uh, you uh, with some of the things that are going on. Uh, I like Ralph Parlett. If, if, if you're not sure who he is, uh, he's the one that wrote the University of Hard Knocks. And I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, in, in, in just a little bit. But he had something in one of the introductions to his book that I thought was really good. And he's just a simple country boy with an IQ probably of 212. But he, he, he just talked like a hit. And, and he, he warned people. He said, don't look at, at me when I'm talking, listen to the message. And it wasn't because he thought he was so smart, but it's because he knew he had a good message. And he said, I'm, I'm like the delivery wagon back when he was doing this. I think he had delivered this speech probably other than, than one other, probably more than any speech had been given at, at various, they used to have Chautauquas and lectureships and, and lyceums and everything else where they would go around, that was their movies. And, and uh, he had given this lecture, like I say, I think it was the, the second most of any lecture given at the time. And, and he, just, he just said, it's, it's like the delivery wagon. Sometimes they're really ugly and they're, they're broken down and they need paint, but they're always bringing you something that you wanted in the first place, something that's useful. Um, I hope what I'm gonna be bringing during this series of lessons will be useful to you. Uh, some of the ideas I have may or may not, I hope they are, but the scriptures will be. And if you can take the scriptures and put them in the context that God intended for them to be put into and put them into the context of your lives, I, I think it's going to make things easier. This last few years has been hard, has it not? It's been two years of, uh, something that we never thought we would see uh, in America. And I imagine people who live in other parts of the world thought they would never see anything like it. Uh, I'm still not sure what to think about all of it. And uh, we have a, we, we have a, a deal at, at the little church of Christ. I, I preach for and happy. Uh, I think we have maybe about 80 on an average Sunday morning and probably half of them uh, have been vaccinated and half of them have not. And the half who are wouldn't have dreamed of not and the half that aren't won't ever get vaccinated. And we just have an agreement. Um, we mind our own business because each person is making the best decision they can for themselves. We're gonna be talking about um, the theme of it's time to start living again. but there's two extra words that have to be added to that. It's time to start living again for God. I believe from what I've observed 
that people have become so afraid of dying that they have stopped living. That's sad. But when you stop living for God, that's, that's fatal. We, we cannot do that. Now, having said that, I uh, want to welcome the people on Zoom. I know that there are people on Zoom who have probably the virus as we speak, and you're enjoying being at home for two reasons. One, you can walk away if you need to, uh, and you can cough out loud and not worry <laughs> that somebody's going to think that, that you're going to give them something. Um, but but uh, so good that, that you could be here. I, I hope it's worth your while as well. But let me get back to this idea. There's a passage in Job that we're going to look at later on this week that says, if God were to withdraw his breath, all mankind would cease to exist. When we talk about living for God, we're not talking about just getting some kind of religious fervor because that's the thing to do when you're around religious people. The only reason you're here is because of God. I know there, there are some people who don't even believe in God. That doesn't matter. They'll kneel before him someday, just as those who believe in God will kneel before him someday. They'll confess the name of Christ someday, whether they believe in this world or not. The only reason that we're here is because God created us. If you accept that premise, then doesn't it make sense that you give him first fruits of your life? And that includes during difficult times like we have lived in lately. I, I have heard so many good things about this congregation. One of the things is this. I think you're a lot like happy as far as each person gets to make up his own mind and, and you don't pester him about it. But the other thing is you've never quit. The, the, the attendance may have been reduced at times necessarily because of the things that were going on, but you never quit. Uh, this is an important thing, not because uh, to, to attend just for attendance's sake, but because when the church gathers together and, and they are worshiping God, it, it has a change within you. It, it makes you realize on the first day of the week when you gather together to break bread that there is a reason that you're here. There's a reason you have a hope for salvation. It resets your, your week. I want to talk about the idea of resetting our lives. Now, getting back to Ralph Parlett, University of Hard Knocks. If you've read the book, you'll remember this. If you haven't, um, uh, maybe you'll appreciate this example. He grew up probably uh, late 1800s, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. And his mother, by definition, then would be old school, father too. Um, uh, I grew up in the 60s, and my mom, I think, may have been related to his mom. But anyway, he said that, that when he was three years old, he occupied the highest position in the house. And he knew that because he had the highest chair at the table. <laughs> And he was there one day, and he saw the coffee pot. Had to have been his earliest memory. And, and he can remember, and the way he tells it, obviously, he takes a few liberties. But, but he said, there's only one thing I needed at that point, and that was that coffee, cup, that coffee pot. And he said, I reached for the coffee pot. And he said, my mother said no. And then he made this point. And maybe some of you will, will relate to this, young and old. He said, there was not one thing in the three years of my life that that woman had not meddled in. <laughs> and he said, it was time to stop. The petticoat tyranny was stopping that day. And he said, it did stop. It stopped with about a gallon of the reddest, hottest coffee that a bad boy ever poured on his lap. <laughs> and he said, for the next several weeks, they slathered him in everything. She, he said, they upholstered him in butter. I think they, they, they used chicken fat. Uh, they used coal oil. He said the Ladies' Aid Society all agreed that his mother just didn't treat that angel child right. <laughs> but as he looked back upon it, he said she, he, she treated me just the right way. He said my mother had a way of handling things. If she told me to stay away from the well. I could go jump in the well after that. And she would sit there. <laughs> she expected me to learn the lesson, and he did. And, and he 
then went on to talk about the difference between needful lessons and needful bumps and needless lessons and needless bumps. And the idea was, if you get a bump for something, that's a lesson. If you learn it, it was needful. If you don't learn it, it was needless and you're gonna go through it again. Well, think about this with this last two years. Have you learned anything that you can apply to your life in a positive way that will not only help you, but will help you in your service to God and will help others? Because if you have, then this was a needful bump. It was something that even though it wasn't fun to go through and even though maybe not everything about it was not fair, you learn something from it. And especially from the perspective of being a servant of God. But if you didn't learn anything from it, if it just makes you mad, if, 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 it, just, if, if it just aggravates you, if everything about it, and, and I'm not saying this isn't maddening and aggravating, but if that's all you got out of it, you're going to get another bump. You have to go through this or something similar to it again. That's the way life is, and it's even more true when it comes to sinful activity. If you learn your lesson, you can move on, you can repent and move on. But if you don't, you have to go through it again. I had two grandfathers. One was a bootlegger. One was an alcoholic. They lived in the same town. I often wondered if they knew each other professionally. <laughs> the bootlegger, when he asked my grandmother out for a date, she said, no, I will not go out with you. And he wanted to know why. She said, you're a bootlegger. You drink, I'm not going to do it. Well, he didn't like that, but he loved my grandma before she became my grandma. And so he gave it up. My other grandfather, who was a nice guy from all accounts, um, a fun guy, without a doubt, um, he couldn't give up the alcohol. He, he ruined his marriage between he and, and, and my grandmother and, and uh, left my mom and my uncle and my grandmother. Went off for a while, came back, said I've given up drinking. She married him again, not realizing that he had another wife in another town and that he hadn't given up. And he ruined their lives again. And then he left. One of my grandfathers learned a needful lesson, and he became a righteous man by all accounts. The other one did not learn the lesson, and he not only became an unrighteous man, remained an unrighteous man, but he ruined a lot of lives along the way. What are you doing with your life? I want to say it again. If God were to withdraw his breath right now, you'd cease to exist. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how fervent you are in your religion or how unfervent. That's probably not a word. You would cease to exist. So doesn't it behoove us to live for God? It is time to start living again. But it's time to start living again for God. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. I'm assuming we've been going for 10 minutes. So I'm starting my stopwatch with that in mind. I cannot believe I didn't start my stopwatch. I use it in, in, in uh, where, I, where I preach, and I always preach a little bit less uh, there than I do here on a, on a gospel meeting, but I will, I will try to keep the lesson to a link that will be useful, and then I will try to stop before you get needless bumps. <laughs> Hosea 10, verse 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. It's time to seek the Lord. And then he says this, but you've planted wickedness. You've reaped evil. You've eaten the fruit of deception because you've depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. The roar of battle will rise against your people so that all your fortresses will be devastated. Whether you feel like what's happened in the last two years have been handled well or not, I, I believe that you'll agree with this. One of the biggest shames that happened through this was instead of saying, these are serious times, we need to do everything we can to make sure that, that we get this taken care of. 
and we need to pray to God for his help. God was divorced from this problem on a national basis, not on, a, not, on, not on your basis, not on a local basis, on a national basis. Let me ask you this. Do you think that anything good can come of that attitude of your excuse, God? We will follow the science. Who do you think created science? The difference between science and scientific theory is science is observations and conclusions drawn upon God's creation. Scientific theory is often something that doesn't even recognize that there is a God. God is the creator of science. And, and when science is handled through the, through the scope of the creator, good things can happen. I had a, a professor at college um, uh, that, that uh, spoke about this. He was an archaeologist, and he said, there became a time in archaeology uh, in the world where they, they used the Bible, and it was an amazing blueprint for where they could find things and about the era that they could expect to find them. And so they would go down to the level uh, of where they thought that era was. And it was an amazing thing, but he said, it became unfashionable and in the eyes of some unscientific to use the Bible as a blueprint. And so they put it away. And he said, this set back archeology span years because they stopped using one of the most valuable tools that there was. Even the archaeologists that did not believe that the Bible was inspired recognized the fact that historically it was an incredibly accurate document. And so when they started using it again, lo and behold, it started helping that again. God's word has always been a friend to scientists, whatever area of science that is. But for those who are more involved with scientific theory, it does not work that way. And as far as this goes, to divorce God from a national problem and to think that you can be blessed by doing so shows an absolute lack of understanding of God's relationship with men. And so one of the reasons that it's so important to be reading the word, and let me encourage you that this year when I say it's time to start living again for God, read his word. You don't need a preacher to explain the word to you, although you have an excellent one here. It will help you if you'll sit down and read it and dig into it for yourself. Luke chapter 13 and verse 5. This goes back to the idea of, well, this hasn't been a good year to really get serious, so I'm going to get serious next year, or I'm going to get serious next year. <clears throat> they had just had a, a, a disaster that they, they were talking about. And, and Jesus. Uh, was just asking him, do you think there were worse sinners than the others in this area? And, he, and so in verse five, picking up there, he said, but I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now, I've been coming back to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any, cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little bit of a dry throat. I've already had COVID, so you're safe. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, fine. If not, cut it down. Now, here's the question. For those who are waiting for the perfect time to start for God. By the way, again, that was Luke chapter 13, verses five through nine. I hope I gave you the right reference. If you've been looking for the perfect time to start and you haven't quite started yet, what if God is looking down upon you right now and he's looking for fruit and he's not finding any? And your position is it's not time. It's not time. There are too many things going on in my life right now. What if that is your attitude, but he's looking down upon you and he's thinking, I'm about to prune this branch off of the vine because that's what Jesus is saying. When the master of the vineyard, when the owner of the vineyard comes, he just says, three years I've been looking for fruit and I haven't found any, cut it down. And then this, the one who tends the vine, leave it alone one more year. 
I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. What if you're in your last year? How would you know? We were almost re reworking this gospel meeting. I, I, Tom called on, on Wednesday, which was bad because I was going to call him on Thursday when I found out. We had a gentleman in Happy, Texas, who was really about as much as anybody you could really say was invaluable and irreplaceable. He, he met that. He was our, our volunteer chief of police. He had, I don't know, 40 years police experience. And he came to Happy. He lived in Happy, but, but he just served for free as, as the chief of police. And, and he was such a nice guy. I don't think he ever wrote a ticket in Happy, Texas. And, but what he would do is he would stop these kids during the lunch, uh, lunch hour that were going too fast on Main Street and and he would just tell them, look, you, you got to slow down. <laughs> and if you don't, he didn't say, I'm going to write you a ticket. He said, if you don't, I'm going to tell your daddy. <laughs> and if you want to know what's effective in happy Texas, <laughs> $50, a lot of kids can afford. I can't afford that still today. But <laughs> telling your daddy, you can't. But they were talking about him because he just, he just passed. He was 71 years old. He wasn't expecting to go, but, but his time came. And he, he just had an attitude of, I just want everybody to be safe. When, when he was the police uh, on the police force at uh, West Texas A&M University, it was 24,000 student body, I think. Uh, if he ever found anybody with alcohol, he would make them pour it out the first time. And, and, and his reasoning was this, I want them to be safe. I don't wanna ruin their life over this. But then he would let them know there better not be a second time. <laughs> and there very rarely was. But he had that type of a personality. He worked for Child Protective Services for a number of years. And there would be times he would come and he'd visit with me and he would tell me about what was going on. And I said, tell him, I don't, I don't know how you, can, how you can do that without taking care of the one who harmed these children in this way. And, and it, it, it wasn't easy for him, but, but his point was, I just want these children to be safe. And so... He, in every aspect of his life, was looking at the safety of, of other people. Now, when he died, I think he was ready to go home. He was a Christian man. And, 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 and so I, I don't want to give you that impression, but I can tell you that it was a shock to us all when it happened. It, it was an un, He hadn't been well, don't get me wrong, but, but not sick like that. And, and whatever time he had on this earth is now gone, his, his turn's over. What if this is your last year? What if God is looking down upon you and saying, this is, this is your chance? Because in effect, whether it's your last 365 days or whether it's your last 3,650 days or whether it's your last 36 and a half days, your time will come. Whether it's the second coming or whether it's the end of your life, your time will come. Just get serious now. It'll make all the difference. Haggai uh, is a book I'm sure you look at every day. We're going to look at it again. Haggai chapter one. If you're wondering where Haggai is, if you look in your index, it'll give you a page number. If you have a phone, you're way ahead. Of, you know, used to, I didn't like the phones in the services because people didn't have Bibles on them at that time, but they did get the Broncos games. Well, actually, they got the Cowboy games. And so, you know, you're, 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 just, you're just kind of suspicious. But now I like these because even my kids in Bible class, they can, they can get there right before I do. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 13. The second year of King Darius, what was happening? The Israelites had been in captivity for 70 years and they had come home. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. 
The time is not yet come was their position. And so the word of the Lord came again to the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. He's going to say this five times. Give careful thought to your ways. Do you think giving careful thought to your ways was important to God? Verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. And then he said, go up to the mountains, bring down the timber, and build the house. In verse 14, it says the Spirit of the Lord stirred up the officials, and it says it stirred up the remnant of the people. They came and began the work on the house of the Lord Almighty in the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year. Remember that, the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 15. Now give careful thought to this, he says. From this day on, consider how things were before one stone was laid upon another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. We were just talking about this today. People go into to a, to a, uh, to, uh, a restaurant and they order a medium shake and they give them something in a thimble. What happened? When I was a kid, a dilly bar was the size of my face. We were talking about that. My face was smaller back then, but the dilly bars were bigger. Now they look like a lollipop. Things are getting smaller. Well, he's telling, he's talking to these people. You're looking for all this and you're only getting a portion of it. 50% in one area, 40% in another. In other words, the fruit of their labor was not being rewarded. And God said, it's because you're not taking care of me first. But now they have been working on the temple. If you look in verse 18, from this day on, the 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. He's now been three months since he talked to them, and they've been building the temple for three months, and it's still the same. They expect to get a lot, and they're getting a little. They expect to get a lot, and they're getting a little. But now he says this in verse 19 at the end of it. From this day on, I will bless you. It wasn't just getting started. It was showing their earnestness of what they were doing. Three months they had to work. Can you imagine what that would be like to build a temple by hand? for three months, but once the three months had passed, God brought them back and he said three more times, give careful thought to your ways. And then he said, this is what I want you to think about. In effect, from this day forward, I'll bless you. Now, think about this in the context of the theme of this meeting. It's time to start living again for God. The first of the year is a great time. I've always liked it. I've liked it so well that sometimes I start the first of my year in the middle of it. I like starting over. I like fresh starts. I really do. This is something that's consistent with scripture. When the Israelites left Egypt, when they came into Egypt, there were 70 of them. There was three more there when they got there, 73. There were two who didn't go in with them that were descendants of Israel. That made 75 descendants of Israel. 73 are alive when they go in. They didn't need their own calendar. They went into slavery. They became a great nation. And then God was about to lead them out. And just before he led them out, he told them this. This month, this month, I think it was Abib or A-B-I-B, -B, however you pronounce it. He said, on the 14th day of the month, this day of Abib, or this month of Abib, will be the first month of your year. And on the 14th day of the month, you are to take this Passover lamb that they were to take aside four days earlier and get prepared. And then they were to offer it. They were to take the blood and they were to put it around their door. And then they were to consume the Passover lamb. And it was going to be an everlasting covenant ordinance for them. They were to do that on the first month. 14th day of every year, and they did that for 1,440 years, plus the time of Christ's lifetime, plus those 
who lived after the cross, still the Jews as part of their heritage, still commemorated the Passover. Not as a religious rite anymore, but as part of their religious heritage. But until the cross, it was a religious ordinance for them. Fourteenth day of the first month, every year, started over. I love the first day of the week. What do we do? We gather around the table and we break bread. It starts things over for us. This is what I'm here for. I've taken care of first things first. Now I can get on with my week because I've taken care of the most important first. I'm not leaving God behind because I've regained my perspective in doing so. But I've taken care of first things. You know what today is? Today is the 14th day of the first month. I'm, I'm sure there's something with that when, when y'all called and said, would you come and do a gospel meeting on this? But it has nothing to do with Passover. We don't have anything to do with the Jewish calendar. I don't think it's even, even similar. Well, it's not the same anyway. We'll put it that way. But how appropriate it would be for us if we have not already to make sure that we are re-devoting our life to what's serious. Because when you do that, then you can take care of the things that are fun as well. The serious is fun. I, I, I can tell you for a fact, I have tried living, serving God as best I can. And I've also tried for a season living, not serving God best I can. And I can tell you it's a whole lot more fun <laughs> serving God the best you can. Because there is no downside to living a life of righteousness. But there's a lot of bumps in the unrighteous life. Now, let me, let me ask you this. When you got your paycheck, if you, if you get a paycheck, I, I'm, I'm assuming y'all probably pay Kurt, what, $20,000, $30,000 a month? Let's say he took his check and, and he cashed it. And on the way home from the bank, he just rolled the window down and he just started idly throwing out bills. Ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds. It didn't matter to Kurt. Money was no object with him. And he just threw it out. The, would any of you do that? You wouldn't. You might be in the car behind him picking it up. Because we view this not as precious because it's a piece of paper, but because of what it will do and what it represents. It represents your hard work. It's also something with which you can pay your rent or your mortgage. You can buy groceries. You can pay for your car and the expenses for that. You need that. You would not be so foolish. At the first of every single week, you, in effect, get a check for 168 hours. Most people take that check for 168 hours and they don't even recognize that they've been paid. It's just another hour and another day and another week. And they will just as casually dispose of those hours sometimes. What is it? The average American looks at television 25 hours a week. I don't say anything about cell phone, Facebook, whatever, your computer. Things that are okay to enjoy as long as there's not a sinful element to it. I'm not saying that. But isn't it amazing? You get that 168 hours on the first of the week. And sometimes you'll look at the first day of the week and you'll say, this is mine. I work hard. I'm tired. And we don't recognize that that's God's day. And, and maybe we'll miss the worship. And maybe we will have not partaken of the Lord's Supper and reminded ourselves of the price that was paid for our lives. And, and maybe we won't come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. Maybe prayer is just when I need something. Maybe Bible study is really just kind of a few verses a day if I've got time. When you get your paycheck, what you typically do if you're a responsible human being is you figure out first things first. I need a roof over our head. I'm going to pay that bill. We need food. I'm going to buy food, part of that money. We have to have transportation. I'm going to use part of that money for that. And, and, and so on down the, the list of hierarchies. And then you get to the fun things. If you've got money left over. And then why not do something fun with some of it? 
I, I can remember one time my son and I, my, my, my son asked if, if we could go to the uh, state basketball tournament. And of course, my first impression was, no, why would we want to do that? But, but he never really asked for anything. And so, so I thought about it, and we did. And I remember as we were pulling out of the driveway, AJ, which was his name, still is, he said, can we afford this? <laughs> which I thought was a good timing on his part because he knew we already had the tickets when we were going. But, but I told him, AJ, this is why we work. <laughs> it's okay to enjoy a part of what God has blessed you with. If you have taken care of first things first with your budget of time, if I can be there on the first day of the week, I'll be there. You may be sick and you can't come. There may be something. We live in cattle country. You may be on your way and the calves may be out on the highway and you got to take care of that. Somebody could hit them and that could be a problem. But barring that, first things first. And so you set your budget. These are the most important things. This is the hierarchy of, of, of how I'm going to live. And then the rest of the week, my job, that's important. Sleep, very important to me. Time to eat, even more important me and then once i've taken school i think most of you young people will admit that school is not important at all but your parents seem to think you need to so go it, it, it'll it'll pay off maybe someday it really will i i i i learned to read uh most of most of what i can read in school so it's a good thing you take care of those things and then you can enjoy other things as well now, let me say this. Enjoy the worship. Enjoy your prayer life. Can you imagine that? If you, could, if you could talk to anybody, who would it be? Just think of all the people in the world that you could talk to. Maybe, maybe you've got a parent that has passed, and you know, oh, if you could just talk to them for five minutes, what a precious thing that would be. Maybe it's a friend that you're estranged from. You could just talk to them. How precious that would be. Maybe it's a child that... that you lost in an untimely way. Um, maybe it's somebody important that's still alive. Uh, who would you talk to? At a moment's notice, you can go into the presence of the creator of the universe. The one who not only if he withdrew his breath from you, you'd cease to exist, but the one who gave you that breath in the first place, who wants you to exist forever. Not only the one who knows the answer, any problem that you have, but he also has the way to implement the exact right answer. This man I talked that we lost this last week, what a privilege it was to get down on my knees and pray to God, whatever your will is, please grant him the measure of health that you desire for, because he could see ahead, not me. He could also take care of his widow. He could also take care of his children. His grandchildren. I, I don't doubt that God answered that prayer the perfect way. It doesn't mean that, that it won't hurt, but what a, what a privilege to talk to the creator of the universe and know that he answered the prayer the exact right way, even if I don't understand it. What a privilege it is to open up the pages of the Bible and find out the answers to any problem that you have, to find the comfort that you were looking for when you didn't think there was any available, to find out how to treat your neighbor and your husband and your wife and your children. When, we, when we're told to give careful thought, it's not just a phrase that's in the Bible. God wants us to be with him forever. Jeremiah 6, 16, he says this, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. But you said, we'll not walk in it. Isn't that something God said? Just stand and look. You find where the good way is and walk in it, and you'll find rest. What is it people want money for? They want peace in their life. They think it'll bring them happiness. They're looking for peace, whatever that peace may entail. God offers that. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. You will find rest for your soul. It doesn't say you might. It doesn't say everything's going to work out the way you want it to either. But it says you'll find rest for your souls. There's nothing better. And yet here, this group of people said, we will not walk in it. 
we, we have a choice. When we talk about it's time to start living again for God, we have a choice. God will give you that choice up until the moment you fail to take another breath. But, but know this, he's rooting for you. He gave his son on the cross so that you could be with him forever, even though he knew when Joe Bill would go and talk to a man who had abused his child, he knew that that man did not deserve this chance. And yet at the same time, he knew that he needed a chance. And, and so he did everything he could first to protect the child and then to make sure that the man or the woman had the opportunity to take care of him. He wasn't perfect his job. God is. God looks at your life and he realizes there have been times that you have ignored the cross. There have been times that you've disdained the cross. There have been times you have treated as an unholy thing, as Hebrews says, the blood of the covenant. There have been times you've insulted his grace. And yet he still wants you. And he has still given you this year, this moment, to say, I'm going to start living for you. I've done bad in the past. Can't do anything about the past. What if I could? But I can do something about right now from this point forward. And isn't that wonderful that for God, that is enough? I, I, that I, I can never get past that. For God, that's enough. He loves you that much that he's willing to give you that chance. Take it. One more passage and, and, and we'll close tonight. Y'all have been y'all have been long suffering at the end of the week on a cold day. Bless your hearts. You've made it through to this part. Um, Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived is how he starts off. The reason he starts off, do not be deceived, is because many men are deceived about this very thing. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I live in farm country. When somebody wants corn, they plant corn in the ground. And they might even sell a contract or two of corn to, to, to the market. If the corn doesn't come up, they've got a little bit of a problem, but, they, but they're not guilty of fraud. They have to, they have to make up for it. But if they, if they want corn and they plant wheat or they plant weeds and then corn doesn't come up, they're not gonna. They're not gonna be surprised. Their banker might be surprised when he comes to try and draw the loan. The guy who bought the contract of the corn that they sold might be surprised, and he might be surprised at the result. I, my 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 uh, part of my 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 studies was in finance, and there was there was a uh, there was a saying for those who short sold, and it was this: He who sells what isn't his own buys it back or goes to prison. <laughs> I wasn't an English major that said that. If you plant wheat and you've sold corn, you're in a lot of trouble. But you knew it going into it. God says, do not be, excuse me. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A lot of people are shocked. They sow sin and they think they're going to reap something good. It can't happen. They're shocked. And that's why God says through inspiration or Paul through inspiration, don't be deceived because they're people deceived all the time. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful rate, uh, nature from that nature will reap destruction. He's talking about hell here, as well as the destruction that comes on this earth. But the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. A guy who wants a corn crop, who plants corn, who does everything he can to grow the corn, he does his best, but the corn doesn't come up, he doesn't get rewarded for it. I can tell you this for a fact. You will serve God to the best of your ability. And we're going to talk about this some more during the week. There will be people that you will go, that you will seek out, that you will try to study with. Some of them will not become Christians. But God will reward you just as if they have. Because God's standard is do your best. Some will become Christians. It will change not only their life, it will change their entire family tree. And God will reward you for that. First, in the joy of knowing this person is saved. Second, in the joy of seeing what it's done to his life and the lives of his loved ones. And third, because you're going to be rewarded 
The one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And so he says this, let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. There will be times you'll be, grow weary in doing good. Jack Carter told of a time when he was a young man and he was riding with an older couple and they got in a snowstorm, much like the one I got in on Monument Hill today, except for more than an inch. And they got stuck on the, on the road and this older couple stayed in the car while Jack went up to get the tractor so he could try and pull them out so they wouldn't freeze to death. He said there was a time or two where he slipped on the way back and went into the ditch. And there were times he felt like just laying there. But he realized if he just wallowed in it, it wasn't just his life that was at stake. It was the life of those two people back there. And by the way, Jack grew up. He got married. He had kids. He had grandkids. It wasn't just what we saw. We get weary sometimes, legitimately weary. But if we will not become weary in doing good, the harvest that we're going to reap someday is going to be incredible. The day of rejoicing that we will have will be beyond our, our imagination. But we have to make sure that we are sowing that which will reap that type of a, of, of a crop. It's time to start living for God will be the theme of this entire week. This will be the longest lesson, by the way. I knew it would be. I thought, well, this is probably going to be the smallest crowd. Anyway, I won't get beat up as bad. I, I hope it's been helpful to you. We're going to keep talking about this, but, but for now, make a determination. If you haven't been as faithful as you could be, to start trying to be more faithful. If you're not a Christian, you're old enough to become a Christian, and, and you're ready to do that, we'd love to help you with that tonight. The invitation is open. If you have any needs, why don't you come forward and let those needs be known. I'll be standing. Walk with